Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Last Sunday during the first service, y'all, even though you most likely weren't there, but y'all as the people of St. Paul sent forth a group of nine high schoolers with myself and then a female chaperone down to Port Arthur for a service trip, a, a mission trip. We were sent with the purpose of being a part of the larger body of Christ in our world. A part of the larger body of Christ going down to an area that had been severely affected by Hurricane Harvey a little less than a year ago. It was an amazing trip. It was amazing to see just how God worked through this group of people that went down there. I would say it was also a pretty successful trip because all 11 returned back safely. We only had one foot through a ceiling, which was going to come down anyway, so that was okay. Uh, we only had one almost electrocution, uh, one zapped with electricity that we didn't realize was live. Uh, and about the only other thing that went wrong was Pastor Hardaway taking off the church group that didn't really teach all that much about hell. When you don't really believe in hell and you're reading through a passage in the Bible that talks about God's wrath, our Bible study that last week was from Colossians chapter 3, which very clearly states God experiences wrath. God has wrath on our sinfulness. There is a reason why Jesus had to die on the cross. As we're breaking off into Bible studies, we're listening to this church group, many faithful Christians, very hard workers, those who do believe that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, they just didn't quite fully understand how meaningful that was. As we're sitting in the group, I'm listening, and, and the ornery part of Matthew wants to say, you know, that's wrong. You're, 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 you sound like an idiot. How, how could you not understand that what this says is real? But that part of Matthew, thankfully led by the Holy Spirit, stayed quiet. <laughs> but, but as the, the conversation went on, and, and especially as the senior pastor of that group misspoke about a passage in Colossians, misspoke and said that Christ is in absolutely everyone on the face of the earth, which therefore means that absolutely everyone on the face of the earth is going to get to heaven. Whoa, okay, now pastor comes out. And after a few more minutes of praying and wrestling with, with how to approach this, not, not just to proclaim truth, but also to make sure those of our own group that were there understood what you're hearing is wrong, I spoke up. It was really interesting, the conversations that followed after that. They called this a worship time for us as Lutherans. It was singing a couple songs and a devotion and prayer. Uh, but the, it, we made sure as a group that once this worship time and the, and the Bible study were over, uh, those of us from St. Paul went off to a quiet place and we did our own Bible study. And I can tell you, we have a very sharp group of high schoolers here at St. Paul. They were able to identify and recognize, even if they couldn't get the doctrine exactly right, they had that gut feeling. Something just wasn't right about what they were hearing. And so we got a wonderful opportunity to talk through that, to talk through how it's possible to, to be a Christian, to, to believe in Jesus and still get things confused, still get them wrong. We talked about how meaningful and important it was to always go from the Bible first and not from here or from here. Each evening there was a, a devotion time and there were, uh, the other group had about 30 or 40 people with them, so a much larger group than ours. They, they divided up the four evenings that we did this amongst the leaders and the pastors that were there. Uh, as a, a good Lutheran, I took the last one just so that I could make sure I fixed up anything that might have been confused throughout the course of the week. Um, and what I'm sharing with you this morning is, is not from the 10th Sunday after Pentecost. It actually comes uh, from that message. 
but it's one that since St. Paul was the one who sent this group, and as the body of Christ here, you guys were a part of what we did, um, I think it's fitting to share how that week ended. The group gathered together, and, and most of the, the kids, I'm pretty sure, thought I was some crazy fat guy with a beard. And they weren't ready to hear what I had to say, I'm pretty sure. Now, there were some that, that were, were much more mature in their knowledge. I don't want to throw the whole group under the bus, but... I, you, you could hear. They, they thought what I was saying earlier was just a cockamamie pile of just blah. So I asked them this question. Have you ever had to ask God why? Have you ever had that point in time in your life when you're going about the day-to-day -day things, waking up, brushing your teeth, going to school, going to work, doing your chores, taking care of the family, going along life, things just absolutely normal, and then it happens. It could be any one of a number of things, but it happens. And you have to ask God why. Now, I knew this was going to happen. It, it's fairly common. You end up in a, a setting where you're interacting with people for the first time. And it's, it's common, especially for someone my age, and when it's found out that I'm married and I have children, to ask the question, well, well how many children do you have? And so I'll, I'll share that, that, you know, usually I share that, that I'm very blessed with three. I'm not being totally honest, though, but in a setting where it's a brief acquaintanceship, I don't like to go into greater detail. It happened this week multiple times with multiple leaders from that other group. Hi, how are, oh, you're a pastor, great, are you married, do you have kids? And, and, and yes, I, I do. You guys know three of them. None of us have gotten to meet the other three. When was the first child we conceived? When we miscarried, we didn't realize what was going on. Kristen was just in a lot of pain, but the pain went away. We conceived Catherine, and Catherine came along and was a great bundle of joy and screamed bloody murder whenever the doctors were working on her that very first moments of life. She hasn't lost much of her spunk to this very day. After Catherine, Sheridan came along. We knew we were pregnant, and also with Sheridan, it was the first time we knew that something was slightly off. By the time Eliana came around, we had established a relationship with a doctor that kind of sort of knew what was going on with Kristen's body, at least we thought. A, a doctor who was Catholic and, and very much valued life and, and all these wonderful things, and he worked very closely with Kristen and I. And, and obviously Eliana is here. It was a great blessing and a great joy. But it wasn't until we conceived Adriel that we began to maybe have a better understanding of what was going on. We still don't know for sure that when Kristen's body was pregnant, the protein levels in her blood became skewed, which meant that she and the baby were at a higher risk for blood clots. We found out that we had conceived. We hadn't established a relationship with a doctor in Kansas City that would understand Kristen's body and what was going on. So we made the commute all the way across the great state of Missouri back to St. Louis to be with the doctor that knew. We saw the ultrasound. We saw Adriel. We were so excited. But even at that same time with all that excitement, there was fear and worry. Would she make it? Would he make it? A few weeks later, we went back for another checkup and found out the news that Adriel hadn't gotten any bigger. The best thing we could ever figure out was that a blood clot would form where the, the umbilical cord would attach to the uterus. And so we, God created life, but then sin got in the way and kept that life from being nourished and growing. We decided then for a while that maybe it was best to hold off. It was a time, all three of those times, where 
you start to realize just how wonderfully blessed we were to have Catherine and to have Ellie, especially when we didn't know what was going on. They, in some ways, were, were miracles because they made it through the risk that Wynn and Sheridan and Adriel didn't make it through. When Hannah comes along, we are scared to death, and it brings everything all back again. This past week, whenever that question got asked, and I can only answer because I don't want to go into this story a hundred times, yes, I'm blessed with three, they're 11, they're seven, and they're three. In my head, I'm going, yeah, they're this great four year four years apart for each of them and and it makes life so much easier I'm going yes I know it's four years apart but they should be so much closer every time this comes up it brings back all those times where Chris and I could only cry out to God why I know my sin I know where I screw up I know where I'm constantly asking God for forgiveness. I know where I deserve his wrath. I know where his thumb could just come down and squash me. I know when I should die because of the mistakes that I've made and the times that I've met, I've gotten God upset with me. But why them? What did they do? They couldn't have done anything wrong. Why? When that question gets asked, the book of Job is the book that I typically go to, to read. In Job, chapter 1, we get introduced to Job. A man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. So that, scriptures say, this man was the greatest of all the people in the East. You could think of him as a modern day version of a devout Christian who is Donald Trump, Tim Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, and Bill Gates combined. This was Job. Job was wildly successful in everything that he did. Job was devout. He feared God. He loved God so much so that if his sons or daughters were eating a meal and maybe forgot to pray, Job would pray for them. He would intercede for them because he wanted to make sure that they were still in God's good graces. Job was a man after God's own heart. Job continues, we we get to scene two of the book, and and God and Satan meet up at Starbucks for a Frappuccino. Real, it's not Starbucks, it's scripture, but God and Satan get together and they talk. I don't understand this part of scripture at all, but I know it happened, because it's here. God and Satan get together and God says, hey, Satan, where are you coming from? Satan says, oh, I've just been wandering to and fro up and down the face of the earth doing the things that I usually do. God says, ah, okay. Well, hey, have you seen my servant Job? That is a man who hasn't done any evil. He loves me. He seeks after me. He trusts in me. And Satan scoffs and says, yeah, of course, God. You've given him everything. He's got no trouble in his life. I bet you anything. If you cause some trouble in his life, he'd turn his back on you. God says, okay, have at it. You can cause all the trouble in his life that you want, Satan. The only thing you can't do is take his life. That's mine. So we read as Job loses all of his livestock. We read as Job's sons and daughters die. We read as all of his property is just swallowed up and disappears. We read as Job's health deteriorates and he gets sores and painful pain all over his body, so much so that all he can do is sit in an ash heap and cry out to God, Why? This past week, we got to, our team that was in Port Arthur got to meet Mr. Roosevelt. Mr. Roosevelt was a family man. He drove trucks for a living. He raised four children. He was a hard worker. Joe, Mr. Roosevelt bought his house about two years before Hurricane Harvey hit. He bought the house, I'm pretty sure, because he needed to downsize. 
few years prior to buying the house, his wife started having some stomach issues. They thought it was GERD, they thought it was acid reflux, they prescribed medicines, they thought it was going to work, the medicines didn't work, and it wasn't until an accidental test by a doctor that they found out it was stage four cancer. She died within a few months of the diagnosis. Mr. Roosevelt lost his wife suddenly, and then the hurricane comes, and within his house, water comes up to five and a half feet. Mr. Roosevelt is all of maybe five foot ten. Mr. Roosevelt was a spry, eight, is a spry, 83 years old, and every time we would go to his house to help him with sheetrocking and, and mudding and taking down ceilings and painting mold preventative primer paint on studs, every time we were there, he had a smile on his face. And just about every morning that we got there, he would climb out from underneath his house where he himself was working to replace the 2 by 12 beams that ran underneath the house because they discovered they had been rotted. Mr. Roosevelt had a smile on his face, even after we broke into his house accidentally and set off the security system. We, we joked that it would probably be the only time Port Arthur police would drive up to a house and see all 11 people on the front porch who just tried to break into it. but. Security team called him and he said, oh, no, that's okay. They're my friends. They're helping me out. Mr. Roosevelt had every reason in the world to cry out, why? So did Miss Katrina, Miss Deborah, Mr. Hudson. So did the solid waste employee. Second day we were there, solid waste from Port Arthur comes. They bring this giant truck with a, uh, a big claw that comes out on the, off the top, and the claw comes down and picks up all the rubbish and puts it in the back of the truck. The uh, truck had two workers on it, one to operate the claw, and the other was the driver. And the driver saw that we had kids that were working, and so he got out of the truck to help make sure that no one got too close to the, the claw. He was there just for, for safety reasons. So I walked up to him and introduced myself, and and asked him, well, how long have you been in Port Arthur? He said, all my life. But how bad was the damage to your house? He said, have you ever heard of PTSD? I said, yes. He said, every time a cloud comes in the sky, every time a drop of rain falls near me, I go into PTSD. He watched as his house flooded, and as it got to about 3 o'clock in the morning, he was outside hanging on to a floating raft, a floating something, scared to death because he didn't know how to swim. Waters are rising, rain is falling, there's currents all over the place. He has no clue how he's going to stay alive. He has no clue what's going on outside of the fact that the hurricane is there until he gets rescued by a helicopter. Every day he tries to go to sleep and he struggles because of the memories. The people in this town, the people all up and down the coast, even not even just Hurricane Harvey, but forest fires across the world, tsunamis, whenever these tragic events happen, innocent people get hurt. Innocent people lose property. Christians cry out, why? What did I do to deserve your wrath, O oh God? It's helpful to go back to scripture at times like this. We learn from Paul when he writes to the Romans in chapter 8, beginning at verses 22, that sometimes these things happen because of sin, but it's not my specific sin that caused it. When Adam and Eve fell into sin in the Garden of Eden, it wasn't just humanity that became broken. Paul writes at verse 22 of chapter 8, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. All of creation has been affected by sin. This is why we have tornadoes. This is why we have temperatures over 80 degrees. This is why we have droughts. This is why we have hurricanes. This is why we have global warming or global cooling. Whatever you want to complain about with our earth and our weather and, and all those problems, it comes from us. It comes from sin and the effects that it has had on this world. The other thing that affects us isn't always the sin that we commit, but just like Satan admitted to in Job, 
What is, Satan, what are you up to? What are you doing? I, I, I've been wandering the face of the earth, up and down, left and right. Peter expounds on this in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, when he describes this situation. He says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. We can say that there's, that God loves everyone and that God desires for everyone to be saved. That much is true. Scripture tells us as much. But to deny that there's an effect of, a negative effect of sin on the world is closing a blind eye to what's painfully obvious. Satan has been given dominion over this world. Yes, Jesus died on the cross for the sins of all humanity. On the cross, as Jesus died, as he was raised from the tomb, as he has ascended to the right hand of God, he is victorious over sin, death, and the devil. But the battle is still going on until he comes again. And Satan still, to this very moment, is trying to thwart anyone who has faith in Christ to turn their backs on him, to do what Job wouldn't do. To turn his back on God and say, God, you're the reason why all this happened and I hate you. I don't like you. I don't even believe in you anymore. Job wouldn't do it. Mr. Roosevelt hasn't done it. And even at times where I've been tempted, Scripture keeps calling me back to Christ. Job speaks beautiful words, 19 chapters into the book. Job's friends come to him after he's uh, naked and the ash heap, covered in sores and crying out in pain, crying out why. His friends come to him and say some of the most asinine things you could ever possibly hear to someone who's suffering. Job even will admit at times, maybe I did do something wrong, but I don't know what it is. And if I did, yes, I deserve to be treated like this. But until I know what I did wrong, how can I even say I'm sorry? I am innocent. I shouldn't be experiencing this. And his friends scoff and say, you must have done something wrong. Just look at you. Job still does not turn his back. And even in the midst of all this, he speaks beautiful words in Job chapter 19, beginning at verse 23. He says, Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead, they were engraved in the rock forever. It's his way of saying, listen closely, because what I'm getting ready to say is very important. It is a core part of who Job is in his faith. He says, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, after I have died, yet in my flesh I shall see God. I will see him for myself even when all this is over and I am gone. I will see him and no other. Job confesses his faith in Christ hundreds of years, possibly even before Moses. That is hope. That is where Job finds his strength. When sorrows come, when trials and temptations assault us, when we're just going through life and it's minding our own business and, and there's medical diagnosis of cancer, of diabetes, when there's miscarriages, when there's floods, when there's tornadoes, when there's any type of property, that, uh, any type of uh, uh, problem that we face in this world, and we cry out why. We too can have that same hope that Job has. Same hope that comes from Christ. Jesus himself says in John chapter 16, beginning at verse 18, Not verse 18. Oh. They are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. Jesus says, the world hates me. The world belongs to Satan, and Satan hates me. You are living in this world, and the world hates you. The world is going to attack you. The world is going to try to hurt you. But take heart. 
Jesus says, I have overcome the world. Jesus never promises that this life is going to be easy. Jesus never promises that we're going to be blessed beyond all means. Jesus never promises that we are only going to experience good in this life. Jesus never promises that being a child of his means you're always going to smile and you're always going to be happy and things are always going to go well for you. No, Jesus says you will have trouble in this world, but take heart. You are mine and I have overcome the world. My Redeemer lives. Jesus, our Redeemer, is living now as we speak, and he's watching out for us. He is loving us. He is interceding for us. He loves us. All too often, we like to take that phrase, Jesus loves me. I say it to you. Jesus loves you. And we take that, and we use it to cover up the problems that we have in this world. We use it like a rug. Oh, man, I, I, I'm, I'm having a rough day with my sinfulness, but Jesus loves me. Life is better. We, we say, oh no, grandma just got a diagnosis that, that's not really good, but it's okay, Jesus loves us. And we put Jesus loves me as a rug to cover up whatever that sin problem is. We're doing a disservice to what Christ did for us on the cross. Jesus does, did not die on the cross so that he could be a rug that we use to cover up our problems. So we, he could be a rug that we just walk on. We just use to clean off the bottoms of our shoes when we don't acknowledge just how powerful it was what, what Jesus did for us, we miss that Jesus dying on the cross wasn't just to cover up our sin, but it was to completely fix our sin problem once and for all. We know that our Redeemer lives, and because He lives, we don't get to walk over Him. We get to cling to Him. We can see Him when He's on that cross dying for our sins, and we can cling to that cross. We can see His love poured out for us on that cross, and we can trust that that love was for me, that love was for you. And as his followers, as his brothers and sisters, as those baptized into his name, we can live in his word, because it's in his word that we find our strength, it's in his word that we find our hope, and it's in this word that we find his truth and his love. It's in his word that Job found his hope to make it through all that Satan was doing for him. It's in this word that Mr. Roosevelt is finding his hope as he slowly gets his house put back together. And it's in this word that you and I have our hope too. That no matter what may come our way, Jesus is with us. He does not abandon us when trials may come. He walks with us. He carries us. And at the last day, when this flesh finally fails, when this breath no longer works, when the brain shuts off, I am not abandoned and I am not alone. I know that I will stand and see my Redeemer. We will see each other face to face and I will get to be with him forever in eternity. That is our hope. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. And now the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our service continues as we receive our tithes and offerings to the Lord for his service. As the ushers are collecting the offering, I invite you to fill out the guest and member cards located in the pew bags in front of you. 